All right, well, we're going to kick off tonight to welcome uh, the Honourable Mark Latham, Member of the Legislative Council. But before doing so, I'd like to just sort of uh, say a few words about our, our sponsor tonight or our webinar partner, which is a very high, uh, high profile Brisbane based, uh, Christian based uh, a PR company. So I'm going to play a short video and that will allow everybody else to log on in the meantime. So let's just go through it. I only go through about a minute. So we'll have a look at that and acknowledge our webinar part. Mercer PR is considered the leading public relations company in Australia for Christian churches, organisations and schools. We've worked beside many Christian leaders across all denominations to deal with issues when they arise. So we had two high court challenges, so they were very high profile. Our whole funding model was at risk. What Mercer PR did was help us turn a story that began as chaplaincy is dead, and by the end of that news cycle on day one, the story had become you know, hollow victory for opponents of chaplaincy. It was just invaluable having Lyle in my corner. As the newly appointed head of Christian SRE, my role was to engage with the media. That's something I hadn't done before. Mercer PR were amazingly helpful in helping me to work out what I should say what my core messages were and what would be helpful to the ministry into the future and be able to help special religious education nationally. I think it's very important to have somebody helping you in PR who gets you. Mercer PR working with many Christian organisations means they come from a perspective of understanding who you are and what your values are and I think one of the things that you need to project in any story is who you are and what are your values. We specialise in reputation and issues management, corporate communications and crisis communications, including crisis planning. So I encourage you to give me a call and we can have a talk about how we can help your organisation. Now, but look, let's kick it off very quickly, Mark. Sorry to hold you up, but uh, That's okay. we, we are indeed delighted to, to have you on board. Uh, I have received numerous emails during the week uh, saying how pleased they were that uh, you had made the time. So thank you once again. Look, what I'd like to do is uh, everybody that's on board now to introduce Mark, but really he really doesn't need any introduction given that uh, Mark's been fairly active in the, in the years gone past. But, but basically, uh, Mark, I have to tell you that you have become the champion of religious freedom in the state of New South Wales and nationally indeed. Uh, which is interesting by because I've read in your own admission that you don't consider yourself being religious. But as many people will say, God works in mysterious ways, Mark. So we'll see how that goes. And uh, now, Mark, I know you have a solid background in politics. So I've followed your followed your career with interest from various aspects, but you are you have a great uh, background in uh, government. Um, you're also a commentator on Radio 2 TV, Channel 7, and various other media outlets, including, of course, Mark Latham's Outsiders on Facebook. <clears throat> Mark, I know that you're a leading opponent of political correctness and identity politics, and we can only say thank you, because uh, it's indeed important that somebody stands up. Now with Alan Jones gone, looks like you're going to be carrying all the, all, all the heavy weights, Mark. Uh, I know also, Mark, which I'm very interested in, because uh, we are going to put a submission in that you're currently the chair of the inquiry into future development of the New South Wales tertiary education sector. And if you've been following the case up there in Queensland with Andrew Pavlow, you'll know exactly how important this is. And in particular, we have an interest in sections F and G of that particular inquiry. So we'll be following that. Um, dare I say that Israel Folau, Bernard Gaynor, the legal cases are well known to you and to everybody else. And every credit has to go to you, Mark, for moving your private members, private members bill in the New South Wales Legislative Council on Wednesday 13th of May, seeking to end the political persecution and the lawyer's picnic, as you say, given the poor and weak legal standard enshrined in the Anti-Discrimination Act. Now, Mark, before we hand over to you, that's just by way of introduction, I'd like David Delima, if we could, to um, just say a few words and a quick word of prayer, if you could just uh, bear with us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Greg, and uh, welcome to everyone, and especially to the Honourable Mark Latham. So, our ministry, Family Voice Australia, we stand for family, faith and freedom, 
and we greatly need more defenders of freedom in our country. So we're so pleased that Mark Latham has stepped up to provide really national leadership in this matter. So uh, all eyes are on New South Wales to see how Mark's bill will fare. And we do pray that there'll be plenty of support from Family Voice supporters and others who are keen to uphold family faith and freedom. So with those thoughts in mind, let's just commit our evening to God in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this opportunity given to us by technology so that we can meet even though circumstances are difficult. I thank you for Mark Latham and for his championship of family, faith and freedom and all strength to him. Lord, help him, give him your wisdom, give him your courage, your knowledge and encourage others, I pray, to stand with him in this great odyssey that he's undertaken. And so tonight, as we explore these issues, we pray that your blessing will be upon our discussions and that at the end of the night, we'll all be challenged and uh, better equipped and enthused to defend freedom. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David. Well, Mark, if we could hand over to you, uh, what we'd like you to do is talk about the issues that we've mentioned, and then we'll try and get into a couple of q and A if we have time. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, well, thanks very much, Greg and David, and to Family Voice Australia uh, for having me on the webinar. Uh, Greg, you mentioned that I'm not of uh, religious faith, but I don't think you need to be of religious faith to recognise the importance of uh, Christianity in particular, because I take the view that uh, so much of the leftist attack, whether we're talking about um, political correctness or postmodernism or attacks on our history, um, they're all rolled into one common theme, and that's the attack on our civilization. Um, and the truth is that Christianity is such an important pillar of Western civilization. You know, as I always say to my children, um, uh, you, you don't have to believe in God to believe in the importance of Christianity for our society. Where, for instance, do we get our common understanding of, of right and wrong in civil society? Uh, mainly from the Ten Commandments and also the teaching of Jesus Christ. So the New Testament remains um, the greatest ever written form of moral teaching, uh, recording the, the ministry of, of Christ. And, and that message um, in, 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 in the good book is more relevant now than, than ever. So the, the leftist attack on our civilization um, has unfortunately involved an attack on Christianity. And whether we're talking about Israel Folau, Margaret Court, the general denigration in the media, or, or the way in which the anti-discrimination board in New South Wales has been weaponized against uh, Christians. This is an attempt, a concerted political attempt to damage Christianity as a way of damaging and rolling back our civilization. So whether you're a believer or not, uh, these are crucial issues that all good people should fight in common. That's, that's my view and, and why I've brought two, uh, I think, fairly important pieces of legislation before the New South Wales Parliament. I think it's safe to say in these areas, both Labor and Liberal have been paralyzed. They haven't acted. They've seen abuses, they've seen problems, but they've done nothing to try and solve them. And, and, and the first private members bill I brought forward was about the weaponization of the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board. All forms of discrimination are bad, uh, but we've got to recognize in New South Wales, we've got the lowest threshold for the acceptance of complaints. And, uh, uh, you know, you can take the example uh, that was put to our parliamentary committee just last week of Katrina Tate in Queensland. This, Mum in January wrote a, a comment on a Facebook page objecting to the drag queen uh, library storytelling in, in Brisbane Library. She didn't mention homosexuality. She said that she didn't want adult entertainers there potentially in contact with their children because, and it, it's true, some adult entertainers have had a history with drugs and prostitution. So that, that's a very legitimate comment for a, a, a mum to make, a mum of four, a small businesswoman. And yet the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Board has accepted a complaint from a, a, a serial a vexatious complainant um, under homosexual vilification. So, you know, you can't understand these things on two fronts. If someone doesn't mention homosexuality, how can it be homosexual vilification? And secondly, why is the New South Wales legal system through the Zany Tribunal, the Anti-Discrimination Board, accepting complaints about Queenslanders, particularly when the complainant we're talking about doesn't lodge any of these complaints before the Queensland Human Rights Commission. So New South Wales, I, I feel, has been suckered in. Uh, it's forum shopping. We're running these complaints on behalf of uh, 
uh, a gay left um, a political campaigner. He's all about hatred and viciousness and personal grudges. And this shouldn't be happening in our society. So I've got a bill to say that if it's a vexatious, frivolous complaint that, that, that's without substance or can be handled elsewhere in the system, it shouldn't be accepted in the first place. Because whether you're Katrina uh, Tate or John Soonell or Bernard Gain are all victims of, of this particular weaponization. Um, the, the, the truth is that the process becomes the punishment. Uh, sure, the uh, fine could be $100,000, but on the way through, you've got to employ lawyers, you've got the stress, the, the, the pressure, the harassment from this complainant. So the process, shamefully, becomes the punishment, and, and, and that's all wrong. So all I'm trying to do with my bill is give New South Wales the same threshold and criteria for the acceptance of complaints that we see in, in other states. Um, and my bill is an amalgam of words that are in the legislation in Queensland and Tasmania, and hopefully it'll be accepted by the Berejiklian government and with other support, we'll get it through both chambers of parliament. And the second one is a, a bigger one and a, a bigger issue, and that is to say that the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act has had, um, um, has had uh, provisions uh, to rule out, uh, to make illegal um, discrimination on many grounds, race, sexuality, disability, family status, and, and, and that's all you know, valid and needed in our society. We're a tolerant nation, but Australia is not perfect in this regard. Well, the, the missing part of the equation here is to recognise that the fastest form of discrimination uh, growing in our society now is, is against Christians in particular, but also other religious faith. So we need to uh, adopt the uh, recommendation of the Ruddick Review from a couple of years ago that New South Wales and South Australia are the only states that don't have anti-discrimination laws covering discrimination on the grounds of, of religious faith and, and also in the bill those of, of no faith. So this is acting on, on, on Ruddick. It's overdue in New South Wales and it's an important part of protections in our society because, um, as I said in my first speech in the New South Wales Legislative Council, um, four of the proudest words in our history and our civilization are for people to say, I am a Christian, and they should be able to say that proudly without fear of denigration, harassment or discrimination in the public square. And, and, and that's what my bill hopes to achieve. I'm, I'm pretty sure later this week it will go to a joint select committee of the parliament to ex examine the provisions. I've worked closely, consulted with people over the past 10 months. We've got the bill in really, really good shape. And I think it'll stand up well to that process of a, a joint select committee of the two houses of the New South Wales parliament. So that's a, a summary of the work I've been doing. Um, thanks again for having me on the webinar and happy to answer any questions and queries that the uh, participants might have. Mark, um, if, before we get, could you say a few words on the, um, on, on the parliamentary inquiry into the, uh, uh, in, into the education at universities. I mean, that's a real issue with the, with the you know, universities are meant to be bastions of, of free speech, but far from it because people like Andrew Pavlow, of course, as you know, has been silenced. What are your thoughts on that, please, Mark? Yeah, well, Andrew has been badly treated at, at that Queensland University. It's just atrocious to think someone elected to their Senate um, who's had legitimate views about the extent of Chinese influence that the university could be rubbed out, rubbed out for his views. You know, universities, again, historically have been one of the pillars of our civilization, uh, where people can freely acquire knowledge, um, contest ideas, speak their mind. But unfortunately, universities in the era of the safe space and the trigger warning have become places of censorship and oppression. And, and what's happened to Andrew Pavlou there is, is dreadful. Our inquiry in New South Wales, I chair the Upper House Committee on Education. And, and mm. while most of the university funding comes from the federal government, um, New South Wales would still legislate as the legislative authority for each of the 10 universities in our state. If they all, if one of them went bung, we actually own their assets, own the, the land and, and the buildings. So, and, and also recently the Treasurer in New South Wales has provided financial assistance to universities because of the coronavirus uh, lockdown. So state governments are still very uh, critical in the um, uh, regulation and uh, operation of universities. And our inquiry is to look at several things, uh, the importance of academic and student freedom, uh, which I've just mentioned. Also, has there been over-reliance on um, foreign students paying their fees? 
And the, the fourth important issue amongst others that we're looking at is this question of Chinese political interference in yeah. Australia, which obviously has occurred particularly through the Australian Labor Party. Uh, but there's a fair bit of evidence that it's infiltrated the way in which universities conduct themselves. Uh, uh, academics are losing freedom. Uh, we've seen at the University of Queensland that so much of what they do these days is, is geared around the Chinese dollar and the Chinese influence. We don't want that in New South Wales. And that's another important aspect of the terms of reference. Thank you, Mark. David, do you have uh, a couple of questions? Yes, there, uh, let me raise a question presented by Geoffrey Bullock, who's our Family Voice Queensland State Chairman. He uh, asks, uh, are you in favour of, or are you against all forms of discrimination or shouldn't uh, our concerns be qualified by referring to unjust discrimination? Well, when I, when I say discrimination, I'm meaning unjust discrimination. I mean, people have got natural preferences and inclinations in life and in the privacy of their home, um, their friendship circles in civil society, very often in a small business workplace. Um, those uh, inclinations and preferences would play out without the interference of government. But very clearly, if, if, if someone's a Christian and they're denied a work opportunity, or a Christian organisation can't legitimately hire a community hall from, from a local government authority. Uh, we, have the, we had the case of Israel Folau, who quite ridiculously lost his job because of uh, statements of faith that he'd made well away from the workplace. Uh, my bill, as drafted, is designed to deal with those circumstances, which very clearly is unjust discrimination in the public space against people of, of religious faith. Mark, a quick question that's come across here was also, what role do you see social media playing in, in the anti-discrimination? I mean, it, or, you know, if, if you or I get up and say that uh, God is good or that uh, we like Donald Trump, social media will go wild and, and it's being used by political activists to stifle our free speech. Comment on that, please, Mark. Yeah, well, unfortunately, social media, when it was invented, people thought this would be a new era of enlightened debate, but it's been the opposite. It, it's, it's been a pylon we weapon of, of censorship where people are targeted, um, uh, corporations uh, are said to withdraw their advertising from certain broadcasting outfits uh, where individuals are denigrated and, and put under all sorts of pressure attempts to convince their employers to sack mm -hmm. them. Unfortunately, Twitter in particular, uh, Facebook is, is not as bad, but Twitter no. is the forum of the left where they target individuals. They talk about diversity, but it's all an attempt mm. to force people into conformity. Mm. That if you don't believe with the left, if you believe in the leftist doctrine, uh, they'll harass you and, and, and drive you out of the debate. So it's disgraceful in that regard and has spilled over into the administration of these anti-discrimination laws. Mm. You know, Greg, I, I mentioned earlier the, the case of Katrina Tate, yeah. the small business yeah. woman in Brisbane, complaining about what was happening in, in the mm. local library. Uh, that's an example of where she posted on Facebook, you've got these left activists who monitor these posts and, and have lodged a complaint accepted by the tribunal in New South Wales to the point where we're going to be wasting taxpayers' money in our state uh, policing the comments of someone on Facebook in another state about a local municipal library issue. I mean, this is just madness. But in the era where the left want to control everything we say and think, all our values, even the, you know this thing about the police now, they can't do that, the OK symbol. Yeah. Control even our, our finger movements. This is the, the fine tuning of society the left believes in. Um, then, you know, we, we can't allow people to be arrested to the extent where they haven't got a legitimate way of expressing themselves on a thing like Facebook. So it's way out of control. And my private member's bill on complaints handling is trying to adjust to the new era of social media where so much of this censorship and weaponization of tribunals takes place. Mark, funny, I sent, a, I sent an email to a friend of mine, a colleague uh, in Parliament, actually, and I said, like this, a little uh, <laughs> emoji sign. Little did I realise that, that 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 is now the sign of white supremacy or whatever it is, you know. Well, it's not, you see, that's <laughs> no, the I point. Know. The left make things up. You know, the next one will be scratching your nose. Correct. Um, and we're all done for. I mean, in that case, it was harassment of the police. The police are out there trying to keep the public safety and the public yeah. health. And the idiot Green MP, David Shoebridge, 
and others are trying to, uh, you know, convince them, convince the public that everything they do and say and, and, and little symbols and hand movements they make is, is all a force of evil. The yeah. evil is in the Greens. We want to control everything about, about our lives and, and make us just like them. Well, that's just not on. Mark, I'm astounded that New South Wales would take an interest in, in some ladies' comments made in, in Brisbane. Uh, what's driving the New South Wales anti-discrimination process that they would want to make themselves national guardians or possibly even international guardians? Well, David, the New South Wales Anti-Discrimination Act was established uh, in 1977. I went back recently and read the second reading speech by the then Premier Neville Rand. And, you know, it was a well-intentioned statute. Neville Rand, I think, would be horrified that it ended up policing Facebook comments uh, in Brisbane about a, a local library. Um, but what happens here is that the, the politicians can legislate um, well-intentioned for a, a fine and noble purpose. But once you set a tribunal up, a lot of these tribunals take on a, a life of their own. And part of the business model, unfortunately, for the anti-discrimination board, I mean, they're a fairly tolerant society. There's not a lot of big work for an anti-discrimination board in New South Wales to do. There's important work there, but it's not, you know, massive on a, a vast scale of tens of thousands of complaints per annum. So part of their model, the business model that's emerged over the decades, is that they put ad, uh, advertising out there, uh, basically soliciting for complaints. You know, we're a racist, deplorable society. Send your complaints in to the tribunal. And then they accept all the complaints to keep them in work, to keep them in business. That's the business model they've adopted. Mm. And really, they've got well beyond the intention of Neville Rand and his Anti-Discrimination Act. They've got well beyond the um, uh, controls that the parliament would normally have on a tribunal. The head of the tribunal, Annabel Bennett, has said that uh, even the limited guidelines about complaint handling, she regards her power as completely discretionary. She's got full discretion to ignore them and other parts of the act if she so chooses. So these tribunals take on a life of their own. They've got a business model which is about accepting all the complaints that they can muster and to get beyond the original intent uh, of the parliament. And, and obviously, you know, the parliament's got to bring them back under control. So is it possible to legislate to prevent uh, any action that relates to an interstate or possibly even overseas matter? Yeah, that's what my bill does. It says that if you're making your public comments in, uh, in a, a place and a way outside of New South Wales, it's not the business of our tribunal. And quite legitimately, every um, state of the Commonwealth has got a human rights or any discrimination tribunal. So if someone in Queensland or WA has said something that's uh, against the law, vilification and the like, then it would be free to, for individuals to raise that in their state. But I don't see why New South Wales should be the repository of all these complaints from Queensland. None of the matters we've raised about uh, uh, Katrina Tate or Bernard Gaynor, Queenslanders have been raised in their own state, in their own tribunal. So we're mugs in New South Wales funding all this. Uh, Queensland has a decent uh, threshold for accepting complaints. They haven't got the problem and, and we're funding it. So if, if that aspect of your proposed legislation gets up, what would police that? I mean, can we, can we bring these tribunals back under control? Well, I'm hoping so. Uh, I referred it to a parliamentary committee to get the evidence out on the table and send a message to the tribunal. You've got out of control. You're way beyond what the parliament ever intended. And my bill, uh, hopefully with the support of the government, will bring them back in decent parameters where they actually focus on legitimate, important matters of discrimination. Because what they've done, particularly in, in entertaining and, and empowering this one particular serial complainant, is to discredit uh, the importance of discrimination laws in New South Wales. Your average taxpayer in our state would think, what an absolute joke that we're policing Facebook comments about a local library issue in Brisbane. So it discredits the whole notion of what an anti-discrimination tribunal should be at state level. So they brought enormous discredit upon the system as a product of their uh, business model. And I think it's very important for the parliament to bring them back under control, to get to the important items of discrimination instead of entertaining and emboldening serial complainants with a whole stack of personal and political grudges. So you're really hoping, Mark, that ultimately the government will have the courage to remove the entire board if necessary and, and reappoint or, or appoint people who will conduct themselves properly? Well, my, my bill is to change the law. 
um, you know, as a, as a minor party in the upper house, we don't appoint the board. Um, we can't influence their culture, but we can influence the rules in which they operate. We want those rules to be fair and sensible. Uh, the culture of the place has got out of control. And I suppose if the parliament does try to bring uh, some sensible boundaries back around the tribunal and they ignore that, then yeah, the government would have to deal with that and, 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 and find some people who actually follow the law of the state. Mm. Mark, very, very uh, topical actually, the, the issues that are coming through and the questions and uh, David will have a look at those and filter some of those questions. Mark, a quick question to you is, I've heard rumours from Federal Parliament regarding the Religious Freedom Bill. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment because uh, there, there's talk that it might be shelved, it may not go ahead. Uh, and this is very important because I know that you yourself have, have uh, a similar type of legislation pending. Mark, can you comment on that for me, please? Yeah, look, it's been a very difficult process uh, federally. They, they had a draft bill and they redrafted it. They then got hit by the coronavirus lockdown. Mm. It's gone out, I think, for new consultation. But, you know, their bill took on some issues that, that uh, I haven't tried to address in New South Wales because I think they're problematic. That is a protection of certain forms of religious speech. Mm. Now, that, that, that can involve all sorts of holy books and, 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 and difficulties in the public debate. I, I'm a believer in free speech, so I'm mm. trying to limit any free speech. I think if there's unacceptable criticism of any individual or institution in our society, the best solution to that is more free speech, where people of good faith put the facts out there rather than just trying to close down someone the way the, the left does through their political correctness. So I'm not addressing questions of, um, of, of, of sort of quarantining uh, certain kinds of, of speech from criticism. What I'm doing is, is putting forward a bill that, that means no more Israel for ours, no more religious discrimination. If you're trying to knock groups around in employment and in the use of, of public facilities, uh, then that, that should be against the law in New South Wales. So I suppose my, my charter, I, I think, is a bit more doable than the broader canvas upon which uh, Christian Porter, the federal attorney general, has, has painted up his bill. Uh, they've had all those difficulties. Um, I also think that the consultation process I've gone through has meant that, um, uh, you know, the very broad support among a lot of religious groups, Christian and non-Christian, for what my bill is trying to achieve. We had a great um, forum, a, a roundtable discussion. It's taken 10, 10 months and, and Bishop Michael Stead from the, 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 yeah. the Sydney South Anglicans has been fantastic. So, you know, he's garnered a lot of support around the different groups. Whereas I think, you know, one of the difficulties with Christian Porter, he's been under attack from both sides. He's under attack from the gay left lobby, you know, the Ian Thorpe type advertising campaign, but also um, the uh, religious groups aren't entirely happy with what Porter has drafted up. So he's sort of stuck in the middle, whereas, you know, I've, I've, I've approached the issues differently and, and got the support of the religious groups. And obviously I think that's the foundation stone for having uh, religious discrimination laws actually carried by the parliament. Yeah, I, I actually sat on the Michael Stead committee federally and, uh, and you are quite right in saying that there was a lack of concurrence by, by a lot of the religious groups on certain points of, uh, uh, of uh, scripture, if you like, or, or um, in terms of uh, where the bill was headed. That said, Mark, uh, again, very topical because I remember when I was um, chief executive of the, uh, the local Aboriginal Land Council out of Picton, Thurrell. Uh, I worked with a number of Indigenous people, 17, and they were the most loveliest people you've ever worked with, Mark. I get really cranky when this BLM issue raises its ugly head. And the facts are continually uh, massaged uh, and, and not only massaged, but totally incorrect in many cases when they're creating deaths in custody. They ignore the fact that two and a half thousand whites were dead in custody as well. So, I mean, why is there, there this reluctance, Mark, for facts to be portrayed as they really are? Well, you know, this is a, a propaganda exercise. They've mm. used the number 432, trying to give the Australian people the impression that 432 of, uh, Indigenous have been murdered. Yeah, effectively yeah. in the Australian prison system or police custody in the 30 years since the Royal Commission. And, and the truth is, I mean, you've only got to think about it for 10 seconds to realise that um, deaths in custody 
are an inevitable part of a, a system, whether you're black, white or anything else, uh, a system where there are life sentences. You know, there are people where their crime is so heinous, uh, rapists, uh, pedophiles, murderers, who quite rightly, the community wants them to die in jail. And in, in, in most cases, they do. So that, that in itself is not unusual. Um, there hasn't been a single murder of an Indigenous person in the 30 years since the Royal Commission, if that person was in uh, prison officer or, or police officer custody. Uh, so it's a massive slur on our prison officers and police who by and large do a, a great job, uh, particularly in this difficult period of the coronavirus. So the slur is out there, the propaganda is out there, and I'd urge anyone wanting to get the facts, go to the Australian Institute of Criminology report. Mm -hmm. the, those reports uh, were commissioned by the Royal Commission to every year give an update on what's happening. And they make all the, all the data is there, you know, the natural causes in prison. And, and, and they even point out that uh, when, you, when you look at that uh, 432 number, it even includes, say, young fellas who steal a car and the police chase them. And, and uh, tragically, the, the drivers wrap themselves around a telegraph pole, kill themselves and a few others. That counts as a death in custody, even though the yeah. police weren't anywhere right. near them and the police wouldn't have known if they yeah. were black or white. So, yeah. you know... Um, all the information is there, but for those footballers kneeling and the ABC and SBS and all the websites and mm. the celebrities going on about it, go and read the Australian Institute of Criminology report. All the facts are there and you'll come away thinking, well, you know, the truth is that our police and prison officers do a pretty good job. We're not the United States, you know, to mm. transplant their uh, crisis onto our country is just ridiculous. Amen. Well said. David? Yes, so I'll ask a question uh, raised by Graham McLennan, and he wants to know about the part-time employee of Greens MP David Shoebridge, and the employee has been arrested for vandalism of the Captain Cook statue in Hyde Park. Uh, Graham wants to know, do you think these people are anarchists, Marxists, or just plain uneducated, and should the New South Wales government bring traditional history back into the schools? Yeah, well, we, we need to understand our history. Uh, we shouldn't have the black armband view of history. It, it should be independent. It should be factual. Uh, there are mostly great things about Australian history, some that obviously um, uh, reflect badly, but by and large, our history has been a wonderful um, unrolling of events and, and, and progress in Australia that makes us the greatest nation on earth. We must have a good history because there's always plenty of people wanting to move to Australia from other countries. You know, we never have to advertise for people to come here. We're a wonderful nation. We've had a great history. So, but as for this um, attack on statues, um, the part-time employee of the Green MP, I mean, what's going on there? Because the Shoebridge, the, the, the Green MP on Friday was saying, oh, there's too many police guarding the Captain Cook statue. And the very next night, one of his staff come out to vandalise it. So you have important. to imagine that the Member of Parliament knew something about what was going on. He's saying, oh, I was in work hours, but... If these things were planned in work hours, planned as part of the, the way in which the, the, the Greens do their parliamentary business, then obviously the staff person should be sacked. Uh, there's no place for people working in the New South Wales Parliament who break the laws of the New South Wales Parliament. We're there to make the laws, not have people there working who just break them. And as for Shoebridge um, and, and his crowd, you'd say, you know, they're wreckers. They're so negative. They're always attacking the police. Uh, they're always trying to rip down our history, our civilization, our values, control everything we say and do and think about. So they're, they're wreckers who want to wipe out the best things about Australia and impose their own narrow negative view upon everyone else. So we must reject that. They've been caught out in this instance of the disgraceful vandalization of public property. And hopefully the young lady involved um, uh, meets the full force of the law for these allegations that have been made against her and that the, the, the Green MP takes some responsibility for it. And another question is from John, who is raising the issue of cultural Marxism and political correctness. And he wants to know, looking ahead into the next few years, do you think this trend can be arrested and reversed before it gets worse? Or do you think it has to run much longer before people wake up and put a stop to it? Well, you know, I, I think the silent majority, mainstream Australia, has woken up to it. Uh, I don't subscribe to the view that because people watch a biased news report on the ABC, they're going to be hypnotised by propaganda. Uh, you know, the public's pretty smart. Um, they, they know the facts. They think about these issues. 
just on my own Facebook page uh, in the past week, putting up material about the truth on, on black deaths in custody. We've had 900,000 views, people wanting to gather information. Now, you know, they're big numbers for people who aren't necessarily belonging to political parties, but they want to know the facts. So um, I, I think cultural Marxism is, is real. Obviously, political correctness is one of its tools where, uh, you know, originally it was economic Marxism, but that fell over with the old Soviet Union. So since then, they've tried to march through various institutions, our, our schools, universities, public broadcasters in, in the media, government tribunals and, and bureaucracies to, to, to spread a different type of Marxism, which is about our cultural values and beliefs, trying to change those fundamentally. So we, we've got to halt that uh, march through institutions. But I also think as the left become more extreme and more desperate, uh, they'll be more discredited. And I think the propaganda exercise about black deaths in custody is, is part of that. Your average Australian would think about it, and it only takes a few minutes to understand that it is propaganda. It doesn't reflect the sort of nation that we are. It might say something about the United States, but geez, Australia is very, very different. We haven't got a gun culture. We haven't got had, you know, the, the policing problems that they've had. So Australians know that. They reject propaganda, and, and I'm very sure that mainstream Australia sees through the increasingly desperate uh, tactics of the cultural left. Uh, Mark, interestingly, I, uh, last year I did a lot of work in Parliament um, talking to a lot of your colleagues. There's talk again of euthanasia being put back on back on the New South Wales parliamentary bill. Um, now I know that uh, the Premier doesn't want any more um, uh, issues that she had last year, as you know, with the abortion. What's your thinking on the euthanasia bill? Is it coming? Is it not? And if so, can we fight it? Well, I, I, I fought the, the radical left-wing abortion bill yep. that was put forward last year. And, 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 you know, we've got to learn from that because that only got through uh, because the Premier, her government allocated speaking time and debating time yep. for it in both houses of parliament. No, no bill on a conscience vote can get through mm. unless the Premier decides that it has an allocation of time to debate it out and vote on it, both in the Legislative Assembly, the Lower House, and the Legislative Council, the Upper House. So hopefully Gladys Berejiklian will be true to her word that that euthanasia bill uh, won't be allocated time in this term of parliament. So we wouldn't see it this side of the next election, which is in 2023. Um, otherwise, we've got to be aware that the same sponsors of the abortion bill, they have been meeting and trying to push the euthanasia Bill, uh, when I was a federal MP, I was a supporter of uh, voluntary euthanasia, yeah, but yeah. Um, I've, I've, I've looked at the issue and, 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 and learned a lot more about it in the 20 years since, and I wouldn't be supporting uh, any of that legislation mm -hmm. in the future, because there are mechanisms, let, let, let's face it, in yeah, hospitals, yeah. people don't suffer right to the end, um, in consultation between patients, families and doctors, there are ways of alleviating pain, and when people very obviously are at the end of their life, uh, they're not put through the, the, the worst of the, the suffering. Paul Green, um, one of the predecessors in the New South Wales Parliament for the Christian Democrats, I heard him speak in the election campaign, yeah. his own personal experience as a, a nurse in that type of, of, of care. And I was very persuaded by his point of view. I thought his presentation was a real mm -hmm. a bell ringer for me. It, it exposed me to facts and I, I think his view is right. And um, when you've got government interfering in this area of law, it, it won't work out very well. You'll never have the adequate protection. So leave it to the system we've got at the moment. There's a lot of caring people in the medical system, let's face it. And I don't think parliamentarians need to override uh, what we've got at the moment. Now, a lot of my doctor friends, Mark, are telling me that palliative care really needs to be revisited far more intently. And uh, of course, there's an answer in that. David, so. Yes, Mark, uh, Graham asks, uh, we know what just and unjust discrimination is. However, anti-discrimination is an inappropriate name and it's really simply a name for social engineering. So can we rename anti-discrimination tribunals and the anti-discrimination process somehow? Well, in some states and at the Commonwealth, they're known as human rights commissions. Um, you know, the, in New South Wales, we've got a, a bigger problem than the name. It is the weaponization of the tribunal against uh, Christians yep. and the absence of uh, religious protections in place. So I'm, I'm trying to focus on those. Um, but, uh, you know, if there's a better name in the future, use that as well. But 
Boy, the New South Wales system at the moment is by far the worst in Australia, and we've got to fix it up with some fundamental rule changes. Mm -hmm. And are you finding any support from the mainstream political parties for your attempts at protecting freedom, or are you finding support simply from individual members? And, and how, how's it looking politically for you in, in respect of getting those two bills up? Yeah, well, there are obviously conservatives, in, some of them left in the Liberal and National parties, you know, the importance of religious freedom and uh, those religious discrimination protections. So I'm getting good support there. The fact we're getting a joint select committee, I think, is um, encouraging uh, that the Premier acknowledges that there's got to be a process here, that it, unlike the abortion bill, that uh, the affected parties, the religious groups, will be able to have their say. They'll be able to make submissions to a joint select committee of the parliament, go and give evidence, be heard, be listened to. I mean, that's a refreshing change compared to the abortion bill. So she's learned that much, at least, Gladys Berejiklian. Uh, so I think that's a step in the right direction. Outside of the coalition parties, you know, you wouldn't find the Greens ever supporting something that helps uh, protect the Christians and their rights, uh, uh, given, you know, where the Greens come from. But inside the Labor Party, there are still people there with a common sense view. You know, the Labor Party's lurched to the left on so many of these identity issues, but there's still some very good people there. Uh, for instance, Ta instance, Tanya Mihalik, the member for Bankstown, set up the um, uh, parliamentary group called uh, uh, Friends of Religious Freedom in, in tandem with a very good government minister, Damien Tuto. So there's a Labor Liberal group, a lot of members um, supporting religious freedom, and hopefully they'll be there to vote in the parliament to support uh, a bill that uh, is a product of the committee process. So what sort of time frame uh, do you think will apply to your bills? Will they become election issues? No, I don't think it'll take that long. Uh, I'd imagine that the Joint Select Committee will deliberate and get its work done by the end of this year. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that need to be said. Uh, there'll be a lot of um, gay and left-wing groups that uh, raise you know, straw man type arguments, uh, reasons why this shouldn't go ahead. Uh, some of that process is inevitable. Everyone's got to be hurt. You know, the worst thing you can have is like the abortion debate, where it's ran through, public opinion is deemed to be irrelevant, and 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 uh, whether you're in the majority or minority position, you've got the feeling that nobody listened. So I think it should be an extensive process, and hopefully this time next year we'll be legislating to fill that gap in New South Wales, as uh, Philip Ruddock and his committee identified a couple of years ago. Yeah. Mark, very quickly, uh, I don't know if your colleague, uh, well, your colleagues in Queensland, but gender dysphoria is a big issue there. It, uh, legislation has been passed, unfortunately. What are your thoughts on that happening here in New South Wales, Mark? Well, you know, my main attitude is mm -hmm. that uh, these are, are questions for um, parents yep. and doctors. Uh, they're not questions for schools, preschools, childcare centres or universities. And uh, we shouldn't have a concerted public attempt in those institutions to encourage, get to the point of encouraging young people to think that if, they, if they've got problems in their life and they've got um, uh, mental issues and the, and, and, and the like, the answer uh, would lie in gender fluidity. I, I think this is a, a crime against our young people. It confuses them, it's unnecessary. If there are issues, it's gotta be parents rather than teachers who handle them. And uh, just earlier today, I was looking at some of the, the stuff that's uh, approved in terms of teacher training in New South Wales about gender fluidity. And again, it's a replay of the safe schools experience where you're getting down to three and four year old kids in a, in a curriculum for, for childcare and preschool being told with the assumption that they know something about their sexuality and that their sexuality can change. I mean, this is all just from another planet. It's bizarre, it's wrong, and it's got to be stamped out. Totally agree, Mark. Um, as we're nearing the end of our, our webinar, Mark, do you have a final word to the many, many supporters of Family Voice who really have emailed me during the week and have uh, expressed their own gratitude for you coming on board? Because you are seen as the, as the, as the champion of uh, religious freedom, as the champion of, of, of you know, the get, getting away, get, getting rid of political correctness. Mark, what kind of message would you like to leave our, our supporters of Family Voice? Well, I'd, I'd say a big thank you. Uh, encouragement and support really matters. Um, whether you're like me with a media platform and a role in the parliament, 
or you're just someone with a Facebook page or you're talking to your friends or, or you know, you're having the, the water cooler conversation at work, this is a time for courage. It's a, it's, it's a time for everyone to stand up and say, we're gonna fight for our freedoms, our values, the greatness of our country, and we're not gonna be browbeaten into submission. So, you know, there's a certain madness out there in the, in the public arena when they get to the point of banning Gone with the Wind and, and classic <laughs> movies and they're knocking down statues, they really have gone nuts. So it's a time for courageous people to step forward, have their say, and, and if you're speaking material and, and that's factual and, and, and you believe in it, keep on going and I really value your support, but most of all, everyone's got to get in and have a go. Thank you very much, Mark. As you know, we, we are here at Family Voice to support people like yourself because you are, in one word, genuine, and I think it's important that we have people like you in Parliament. So, Mark, on behalf of all the uh, supporters and, and members of Family Voice nationally, because this is a national webcast, um, thank you very much for coming on board and uh, let us know how we can be of support, but in particular also, uh, we look forward to you joining us at a later date. So thank you very much, Mark. A pleasure. Thanks for your time this evening. Thank you, Mark. Good night.